right guys uh, yeah i've been informed about the audio yeah so we'll be talking about the chemo regime in the gi malignancies yeah got it got it now in the so we've not started much so it is about the uh chemo regimes of the gi malignancies we'll be starting with the esophageal cancer the regime is what we call it as the ecf regime e stands for epirubicin t stands for cisplatin and f stands for five fluorouracil it is going to be five fluorouracil now for the carcinoma stomach for the carcinoma stomach it is going to be same regime that is your ecf regime only you have epirubicin cisplatin 5 fluorouracil then you have for the gastrointestinal stromal tumor it is the imatinib now whenever there is resistance to imatinib if it is resistant to imatinib, then sunitinib. Then sunitinib has to be given. For small intestinal adenocarcinoma, for colorectal cancer, for the colorectal cancer, for both of them, we have the fall fox regime and the fall foviri. And fall fox F O L stands for folinic acid. It is the folinic acid. It is the folinic acid. F stands for five fluorouracil. O X stands for oxaliplatin. O X stands for oxaliplatin. Right. Another regime that we have, it is your falfovir. This is again FOL stands for folinic acid. That is a leucovorin. F stands for 5 fluorouracil. And IRI stands for irinotecan. It is the irinotecan. Right? So esophageal cancer, carcinoma stomach, just small intestinal adenocarcinoma, colorectal cancer and the last one is going to be your squamous cell cancer of the anal canal. The squamous cell cancer of anal. Now for the squamous cell cancer of the anal canal, we have the negros regime. We have the negros regime. Now, in the Negros regime, it is going to be the chemo radiation. So, 5 fluorouracil with metamycin C. 5 fluorouracil with metamycin C with radiotherapy. With radiotherapy, that is for your squamous cell cancer of the anal canal. Right? So, these are for the GI malignancies that you have the chemo regime. Right? Then you have the radiological signs in the GI malignancies or the GI segment per se. So we have the radiological signs. We have the radiological signs in the GI malignancies or in the in, in entire GI context, right? Now we'll start in the esophagus first. Now, if you have the leomyoma of the esophagus. We talk about Leo myoma of the esophagus. This is going to present to you with a teacup sign. This is going to be associated teacup sign. Then you have dysphagia lusoria. The dysphagia lusoria is going to have a victory sign or a V sign, right? Then you have the Zenker's diverticulum. Zenker's diverticulum, you will have a cervical pouch. 
cervical pouch sinusy then you have eosinophilic esophagitis for eosinophilic esophagitis you will have tacked mucosal rings you will have the feline esophagus or the stacked mucosal rings will be seen then conditions like aclasia cardia which is a motility disorder in the aclasia cardia you have the bird beak appearance you have the mega esophagus the bird beak the mega esophagus or the rat tail sinus scene or the rat tail sinus seen across right after ecclesia cardia you'll see diffuse esophageal spasm in the diffuse esophageal spasm we have the corkscrew appearance we have the rosary bed appearance the corkscrew is there rosary bed appearance is there and the pseudo diverticulum and the pseudo diverticulum is then you have the esophageal cancer for esophageal carcinomas we have the apple core sign we have the apple core sign and the shouldering and the shouldering sign is noted and the shouldering sign is noted in your congenital hypertrophic pyloric stenosis it is associated with double track it is associated with a double track sign right in diordinal atresia in diordinal atresia you have double bubble sign its presence of double bubble sign in jejunal atresia in jejunal atresia there is presence of triple bubble sign this presence of triple bubble sign now in crohn's disease there is an ibd in the crohn's disease you have the string sign of cantor there is string sign of cantor for ulcerative colitis there will be presence of lead pipe appearance presence of lead pipe appearance for diverticulosis for diverticulosis you have the sawtooth appearance there is sawtooth appearance right in volvulus in volvulus you have the coffee bean sign there is also the bird of prey sign it is a coffee bean or the bird of prey sign is there in intersusception in intersusception we have the claw sign in intersusception we have the claw sign in colon cancers again there is apple core sign. This presence of apple core sign. In pancreatic head cancers, there is double duct sign. There is double duct sign, right? Uh, if there is in chronic pancreatitis. in chronic pancreatitis especially in the er cp you will see presence of chain of lakes appearance so this chain of lakes appearance is noted so this chain of lakes appearance is noted if it is in the context of chronic pancreatitis in terms of chronic pancreatitis right right uh are we missing out any other uh, signs or the radiological signs that we have okay 
so these are the various important radiological signs that you should be aware of in terms of the gi status now when you look at the images per se just quickly go through the images as well now if you can see very carefully uh okay now before we go down to the images sir, uh we'll take up a quick succession about the vascular disorders also which is also an important exam question right now in the vascular disorder i'll be talking about the varicose veins so we'll talk about the seep classification we'll talk about the seep classification in varicose veins in terms of varicose right now in seep classification c stands for clinical p stands for clinical e stands for etiological a stands for anatomical and p stands for pathophysiology P stands for pathophysiology, right? So we'll be elucidating clinical classification, etiological classification, anatomical classification, and the pathophysiology, right? Now, let's look at the clinical classification. We have the C0, which is asymptomatic. C0 indicates asymptomatic. C1, there is presence of a telling ectasia, telling ectasia or reticular veins. Telling ectasia or reticular veins, that is C1. C2 will be presence of varicose veins. C3 is presence of edema around the level of ankle. C4A is presence of pigmentation c4b is presence of lipo c4c is corono this corono c5 it is healed venous also it is the healed venous also. C6 is your active venous also. It is the active venous ulcer. C6R, it is your recurrent venous ulcer. It is your recurrent venous ulcer. In the etiological status, we have EP, that is your primary etiology. ES that is your secondary etiology. EN there is no etiology formed. Anatomical it is AS that is involvement of superficial venous system. AD is involvement of deep venous system. AP it is the perforator involvement. And AN there is no anatomical site noticed. A P stands for pathophysiology. It is PR, that is, it is because of reflux of blood flow. PO, it is because of obstruction to blood flow. It is the obstruction to the blood flow. PRO, it is both reflux with obstruction. It is both reflux with obstruction. PN, there is no pathophysiology that is found. PN, there is no pathophysiology that is found, right? So this is with respect to the sieve classification. Again, a very important topic from the exam perspective. Right? Okay. So for any questions, guys, quick feedback. So for any questions, quick feedback. Okay, chal. so let's continue across. Okay, chal. so we'll be talking about uh, 
another very important aspect of uh, in terms of thyroid cancers so when you talk about the thyroid cancers in the thyroid cancers we have the papillary cancer thyroid follicular cancer thyroid anaplastic carcinoma and the medullary cancer and the medullary cancer thyroid now papillary cancer thyroid these are follicular origin these are follicular origin follicular is also follicular your anaplastic is also follicular medullary cancer thyroid is your para follicular origin it is the para follicular c cells origin it is the para follicular c cell origin papillary cancer thyroid is the most common thyroid cancer overall follicular cancer thyroid is the most common thyroid cancer in ectopic thyroid gland in ectopic thyroid gland anaplastic is associated with the worst prognosis medullary cancer thyroid it is associated with multiple endocrine neoplasia too it is associated with the men 2 syndrome this is associated with the men 2 syndrome now the risk factors for the papillary cancer thyroid number one is a thyroglossal duct cyst and history of radiation exposure it is a history of radiation exposure that is a for follicular cancer thyroid it is long standing goiter it is because of long standing goiter there are no specific risk factors here right now papillary cancer thyroid is going to present to you as solitary thyroid nodule like presentation nodule like presentation will present to you a solitary thyroid nodule like presentation follicular cancer thyroid will present to you with goiter like presentation with pulsatile forehead bony swelling now this pulsatile forehead bony swelling i hope everybody knows it that is because of secondaries to the forehead which is going to be osteolytic secondary this is because of osteolytic secondaries anaplastic cancer on the other hand it is going to present to you as a massive midline neck mass massive midline neck mass associated with severe pressure symptoms associated with severe pressure symptoms in medullary cancer thyroid they are associated with solitary thyroid nodule like presentation solitary thyroid nodule like presentation with addition to that you will see presence of diarrhea that is because of increased serotonin because of increased serotonin that you see in your medullary cancer thyroid now when we say the mode of spread now in the mode of spread papillary cancer thyroid this is going to be spreading via lymphatics this is going to be via hematogenous this is going to be direct this is going to be lymphatics with hematogenous this is going to be lymphatics with hematogenous that is going to be occurring across right now what is the most common site for secondary the most common site for secondary the most common site for secondary in the papillary cancer thyroid this is going to be see when you when you talk about the papillary cancer thyroid the follicular cancer thyroid the most of the components that you will see they are going to have a lymphatic spread right so you talk about lymphatic spreads via the lymphatics they can reach down to the various components usually they go to the lungs here this is going to be bones directly again it is going to be lungs here it can go to liver if not then it can go to bones 
Now the carrier message for you here in follicular cancer thyroid they form osteolytic secondaries in medullary cancer thyroid they form osteoblastic they have the osteoblastic secondary right? now when you talk about the histopathological status on the HPE finding that is histopathological examination on HPE status here you will see presence of orphan anii nuclei orphan anii nuclei and there is presence of samoma bodies there is presence of samoma bodies that you will see right now some of our bodies are basically they're nothing but dystrophic calcifications some of our bodies are nothing but dystrophic calcifications and the condition they are seen is can be remembered by psm p stands for the papillary variant of renal cell carcinoma as well as thyroid cancer this is your serous cyst adenoma of ovaries Cirrhosis adenoma of ovaries and M stands for meningioma. M stands for meningioma. Now, in uh, the follicular cancer thyroid, there will be presence of oxyphilic cells. There will be presence of oxyphilic cells. Nothing spectacular here, but in medullary cancer thyroid, there will be presence of amyloid. There will be presence of amyloid in stroma. There will be presence of amyloid in stroma that you will see in the medullary cancer thyroid. In the medullary cancer thyroid. Okay. So this is okay. So this is with respect to thyroid cancers. Yeah. So let's move on with another topic. We're talking about in uh, systemic part few important miscellaneous topics that we have. Uh, we'll be discussing about polycystic kidney disease. Now, polycystic kidney disease is divided two components we have the adult and the child we have the adult polycystic kidney disease and a child polycystic kidney disease the adult polycystic kidney disease is an autosomal dominant disorder it is an autosomal dominant this is autosomal recessive this will have bilateral presentation this will also have bilateral presentation it is associated with chromosome number 16 and chromosome number 4 this is associated with chromosome number 6. This is associated with bilateral renal failure. Here also it is associated with bilateral renal failure. It is associated with bilateral renal failure. Right. So management for both of them. Right. For adult as well as child. You can go ahead initially with Rovsing surgery as a limiting factor but ultimately they will require renal transplant they will require the renal transplant in the end which is the most common one right now when you talk about the uh, other components in the urology we have the renal stones the management of renal stones are important so we'll talk about the management of nephrolithiasis the management of nephrolithiasis right now in the nephrolithiasis in the management of nephrolithiasis we will see what are the demarcating sizes that we have right Achha, before we move down i would like to talk about the electrocrystalline images the crystalline image of stone now in the crystalline images of stone Number one is going to be calcium oxalate monohydrate. 
इट इज ए कैल्शियम ऑक्सलेट मोनोहाइड्रेट Now this calcium oxalate monohydrate would look something like this. Huh? This is what we call it as the dumbbell shaped. This is what we call it as the dumbbell shaped crystals, right? Now then you have the calcium oxalate stones. The calcium oxalate stones huh? per se will have a presentation which is like this, huh? which is called as the envelope shape. This is envelope shaped. Then you have the brushite stone. Brushite will be like the sharp needles which are present. So this is needle shaped. Then you have the uric acid stone, which is going to be in a rosette manner. So I will present to you in a rosette manner. So you will see the this will be in this particular that will present. This is your rosette manner. Okay. Or sometimes it is also called as multi rosette or multi faced. Then you have the struvite. Struvite stone. This is going to be in this particular manner, and this is what we call it as the coffin lid. This is what we call it as the coffin lid presentation. Now, in terms of presentation, right? If they ask you what is the most radio opaque stone, the most radio opaque stone overall, the overall most radio opaque stone is going to be phosphate stone, which is nothing but your struvite stone. Which is the most common nephrolithiasis? Most common renal stone overall is the calcium oxalate stone. It is the calcium oxalate stone. Most common radiolucent stone. The most common radiolucent stone is your uric acid stone. It is the uric acid stone. Now, stone associated with the worst prognosis among all, it is going to be the phosphate stone. It is called as the phosphate stone. Right? Now, when you want to look at the management, now the management we will see if the stone is less than or equal to 5 millimeter if it is between 6 to 15 millimeters and if it is beyond 15 millimeters if the size of the stone is less than 5 millimeters then we will go ahead with conservative management go ahead with conservative management if it is between 6 to 15 millimeters then we will go ahead with ESWL ESWL is extra corporeal shock wave lithotripsy. It is your extra corporeal shock wave lithotripsy. If it is more than 15 millimeters, then we have to go. If it is in the real parenchyma, we can go with PCN, percutaneous nephrostomy and lithotripsy. You can do a ureteroscopic stone lithotripsy that is your URSL if it is in the distal ureter. If it is present in the distal ureter, right? You can do a PCNL or a URSL, and you can do also do an open surgery that is done for the phosphate stone. You know, phosphate stone. Now remember stones that cannot be broken down by ESWL. Stones that cannot be broken. Stones that cannot be broken by ESWL. The stones that cannot be broken down by ESWL can be remembered as the ABC stones. It is the hydroxy appetite stone. It 
क्रेजी हाइड्रॉक्सी एपेटाइट्स हो रूशाइट्स हो रूशाइट सो सिस्टीन विच इज द हार्डेस्ट सिस्टीन सो सिस्टीन सो यानी ऑफ कैल्शियम ऑक्सलेट मोनो हाइड्रेट दैट हैपेंस टू बी योर डंबल्स राइट दैट हैपेंस टू बी योर डंबल सो राइट these are the ones which cannot be broken down by yes right now another trending topic in the exams is about the renal cyst now for the classification of renal cyst on the basis of ct we have a classification that is called as the boss naik classification we have the bosnaik classification now according to the bosnaik classification we have the class on one end description on the other end and the probability of malignancy probability of malignancy right so we have the class one class one is what we call it as simple cyst in simple cyst it is normally a fluid filled cyst a uh, probability of this being malignant is going to be 0% right this is a simple cyst class 2 it is your minimally complex it is minimally complex cyst in the minimally complex cyst there will be a cyst with a thin septum it's a single septum a thin septum with some calcification will be noticed right so it has got a single thin septum minimally complex means there is thin single septum and the probability of this being malignant is also 0% then you have 2f that is minimally complex requiring follow up this is called as minimally complex it is a minimally complex requiring minimally complex requiring follow up now the reason why it requires follow up it is because of presence of thick calcification now here you will notice that if this is the cyst that is present there is a thin septation but here compared to the two the two of will have thick calcification here you will see there is presence of thin calcification here it will have a thick calcification the probability of this cyst being malignant is approximately 5% it is going to be approximately 5 right then you have the category 3 or the class 3 class 3 is indeterminate it is indeterminate where you have the cyst with multiple septations which are present few of the septas will also be thick walled not the thin walled and there will be presence of nodule inside the cyst wall we call it as intramural nodules right so indeterminate will have a thick septa this present thick septa the multiple septa and presence of intramural nodule this presence of intramural nodule and the probability of this being malignant is 50% and the last one that you have it is a malignant cyst it is a malignant cyst where you have a solid mass with cystic space so you will notice uh, this will be a nice solid mass that is present uh, within this nice solid mass there is this nice cystic space in between so there is present a solid mass with cystic space solid mass with cystic 
द प्रोबेबिलिटी ऑफ दिस बीन मैलिग्नेंट इज वन हंड्रेड परसेंट इट इज गोइंग टू बी वन हंड्रेड परसेंट राइट नाउ द फर्स्ट टू इन टर्म्स ऑफ मैनेजमेंट इन टर्म्स ऑफ मैनेजमेंट यू डोंट नीड टू डू एनी थिंग नो इंटरवेंशन इज रिक्वायर्ड इन दीज टू here you have to go with the follow up that is a usg or a ct follow up is required and this is done every 12th monthly here you have to go with partial nephrectomy and in here you have to go with total nephrectomy you have to go ahead with total nephrectomy should be performed a total nephrectomy should be performed in these topics right so this is how you are going to evaluate the renals again very very important topic from the exam perspective yeah okay now another important topic in the uh, urology is going to be tb kidney to try to understand the important aspects of the tb kidney or the points relevant to tb kidney right now the first thing how does it spread to kidney the root of spread it is the root of spread to kidney it is usually via the blood that is hematogenous this is going to be hemato okay. what is the most common primary site in kidney the most common primary site in kidney it is going to be the renal papillary most common primary site in kidney it is deposited in the renal papillary it is the renal papillary right that is the most common primary site in the kidney now what are the findings in kidney findings in kidney number one it will result so as the kidney is going to get affected it is going to result in development of pus filled kidney that is called as putty kidney it will convert into hard that is cement kidney and ultimately resulting in development of auto nephrectomy associated with auto nephrectomy okay so the root of spread is hematogenous most common primary site in kidney is renal papillary the findings in the kidney will be a putty kidney your cement kidney and the auto nephrectomy that you will see now most common primary site of tb kidney in bladder in bladder is around the ureter it is around the ureteric orifice it is around the ureteric orifice findings in urinary bladder findings in urinary bladder number 1 there will be presence of golf hole ureter this presence of thimble bladder the golf hold ureter and thimble bladder now thimble bladder is described as it is described as a fibrosed condensed it is described as a fibrosed condensed and shrunken bladder it is a fibrosed condensed and the shrunken bladder that is the findings on your urinary bladder that you will see right what are the findings that you will see on the vas deferens what are the findings that you will see on the scrotum on the vas deferens it will present to you as beaded vas deferens in scrotum there will be presence of multiple discharging sinuses this presence of multiple discharging sinus that you will see in the these are the findings that you will see in the tb kidney and the i mean the entire urogenital tuberculosis that is going to be present in this particular manner yeah okay
Now radiological signs we'll see here. We'll see the radiological signs in uh, uh, urology. We have the radiological signs in uh, urology. Guys, PDF I'll send. Somebody is asking for a PDF. Yeah. Right. In the radiological sign in urology, in hydronephrosis, what are the signs that you will see? It is the rim sign. The presence of a soap bubble sign, a rim sign, a soap bubble sign, and a crescent sign. That is hydronephrosis. Polycystic kidney disease will have spider leg appearance. In horseshoe kidney, there is flower vase appearance. There is flower vase appearance. In TB bladder, it will present to you as the golf hole ureter. It is the golf hole ureter that you will see. That is your TB bladder. Then you have uretro seal. For uretro seal, you will see adder head. The adder head appearance or the cobra head appearance. The adder head or the cobra head appearance. The adder head or the cobra head appearance that you have. Right now, in uh, in top of BPH, in benign prostatic hyperplasia, the presence of fish hook bladder. The presence of fish hook bladder that you will see across here. Right. Okay. In schistosomiasis. The schistosomiasis of bladder. Now the schistosomiasis of bladder will present to you as sandy patches. It is the sandy patches. <clears throat> okay. So this is with respect to the radiological signs and urology which are going to be important from the basic perspective. Okay guys. Okay. Right, so these are with respect to the radiological aspects in the basic objective that you can see in the context per se. Now, a uh, couple of uh, other image based questions that we have, I have completed yesterday. Okay, uh, right. Fine, so I'll just input another document. Uh, We'll take a short break here, right? Uh, for two minutes and then we'll resume back. Okay. Give me a short break here.
Right, guys. So let's get started. Yeah, we'll be talking about the suturing part. Uh, again, an important concept. In terms of suturing rule, what is the length of the suture material required? It should be four times the length of the wound. It is a four times the length of the wound. Now, if the depth of the wound is taken as x centimeters. Uh, remember the length i mean in terms the depth is very determinant for the pricking area the distance between these two if the depth is x centimeter it should be x centimeter here it should be x centimeter here distance between the two sutures should be twice the depth that is 2x the angle between the needle and the skin is going to be 90 degrees distance between two sutures is twice the depth it should be twice the depth of the wound the length of the suture ear can be left after suture ear is nothing but after you tie down whatever you cut after knotting the suture whatever is left behind is a suture ear and that has to be one to two millimeters that's a one to two millimeters yeah. so in the suturing techniques you have the various suturing techniques this is what we call it as the simple running sutures This is a simple running suture. This is going to be the simple suture, simple interrupted suture. This is your simple interrupted suture. Now, when you see here, if this is the orientation and this runs like this, right? Now, this is what we call it as the vertical mattress sutures vertical mattress suture this happens to be the horizontal it is the horizontal mattress sutures and this is your sub cuticular suture this happens to be sub cuticular suture now, in terms of best cosmetic outcome, it is your subcuticular sutures that are present. Right? So these are the various suturing techniques that we have. In knotting, this is what we call it as a simple knot. This is what we call it as the half H knot. This is half H or a single loop. Right? Now you can see here. <clears throat> now this is the loop and you see one thread is going under the loop and one thread is going over the loop right here also one is over one is under so this is what we call it as the granny's knot this is what we call it as granny's knot but if you see here you see both the threads are going under the loop or both the threads are going over the loop this is what we call it as the square knot this is what we call it as the square knot or also referred to as the reef knot the square knot or the reef knot the granny's knot is an unstable knot this is an unstable knot granny's knot is an example of a unstable knot whereas when you talk about the square knot or a reef knot this is an example of a stable knot this is an example of the stable when you look across here a slight correction has to be made in this diagram you will see this is in this form and this is in this form right now you can see when we talk about this particular knot i've made a correction that you know these are on the same direction they're under the loop that is present or they are present over the loop but you see there are double twists right two loops are present the two loops there are two loops which are present one second right there are two loops which are present and on top of it is one other loop and this is what we call it as the surgeon's knot this is what is called a surgeon's knot this is an example of a stable knot this is an example of a stable knot that you have to remember yeah another one is going to be the suture removal period now in the suture removal period when will you remove the sutures if it is on the face it is on to three to five days 
for scalp it is 7 to 10 days arms also it is going to be 7 to 10 days trunk it is going to be 10 to 14 days legs are also 10 to 14 days hands and feet is going to be again 10 to 14 days and palms and sole is going to be 14 to 21 days it is going to be 14 to 21 days right so these are your suture removal period, right so these are the various aspects that you should remember and recall with respect to your important topics right so we try to cover as many uh, quick review topics as possible to try to keep the discussion crisp as well uh, if you have any questions i will be willing to take a q a uh, quick feedback anything that you want to ask anything that you would like to uh, uh, in general sense if any doubts are there uh, feel free to ask a quick feedback on the same talk content Any questions guys, quick feedback. uh suture technique it, it depends on the location skin we usually put mattress but when you want to have a cosmetic outcome then i'll be putting subcuticular especially in the neck incisions now if you're putting in the muscles if i'm closing a rectus i'll always be using a continuous suture but without any locking mechanism right now if you're putting a subcuticular sutures then again it will be running in terms of cosmesis if you're putting a subcutaneous ones, which is to integrate the fat together, where I'll be using an absorbable suture material, there I'll put interrupted suture material, right? Bubble, it is usually continuous, we'll be using silk, right? It, it does not depend per se as location, but it depends upon the demand as you want to do. Nowadays, we're moving away from sutures, we are now using staplers, uh, which is easier to remove, less painful and easy to apply. All right, guys, so any questions further? If not, then all the best for the exam. Uh, you can always follow us on our uh, PW Method app as well as on the Instagram and the Facebook pages. Uh, keep asking questions. If you have any doubts, feel free to reach out. Uh, do revise. We try to cover the topics as well. This is just to get your boost on, get your preparation on track. Any questions, please do stay connected. All right? So that's it from my end. Signing off for today. Thank you very much. Bye.